What's up, you beautiful bastards? Hope you're having a fantastic Wednesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today is the massive news and update around the Austin bomber. According to Austin Police Chief Brian Manley, investigators had identified several leads about the possible perpetrator throughout the course of the last several weeks. And in the past 24, 36 hours, police started receiving information about one person of interest in particular. And as that investigation continued, the person of interest moved to being a suspect. Police had a surveillance team out looking for the suspect and his vehicle, which they end up finding in a hotel parking lot in Round Rock which is a city just north of Austin, but I'll let Brian Manley explain what happened next. We had multiple officers from both the police department and our federal partners that took up positions around the hotel awaiting the arrival of our tactical teams because we wanted to have ballistic vehicles here so we could attempt to take this suspect into custody as safely as possible. While we were waiting for those vehicles to get here, much time had passed and the vehicle started to drive away. We began following the vehicle, again, waiting to get the tactical uh, vehicles here so we could take this, uh, make a stop. However, the vehicle ended up stopping in the bar ditch on the side of the road behind us. As members of the Austin Police Department SWAT team approached the vehicle, the suspect detonated a bomb inside the vehicle, knocking one of our SWAT officers back, and one of our SWAT officers fired at the suspect as well. The suspect is deceased uh, and has significant injuries from a blast that occurred from detonating a bomb inside his vehicle. So the suspected Austin bomber blew himself up, and I will say personally, that was fantastic news to wake up to. Now that said, that I'm glad that a murdering monster is no longer on this planet and is no longer a threat to the community, there is a bad part of this, and that is a lack of information. Because while yes, the suspect is believed to have been behind all the bombings, police have not ruled out that he had accomplices. The police also don't know where he spent the last 24 hours of his life. And so that's why they're still urging the community to remain vigilant, also to report any suspicious packages be careful. We still need to remain vigilant to ensure that no other packages or devices have been left through the community. Also, as far as motive for these bombings, we do not currently know, but hopefully the investigation gives us some answers. As far as how the suspected bomber was found, police aren't releasing a ton of information right now, but there are sources involved in the investigation that have spoken to local media. According to Austin American Statesman investigative reporter Tony Plahetsky, the key was that all the bombs were made from household ingredients. And so as a result, investigators focused on retail stores that may have sold these items to the suspect. According to Blahetsky's sources, agents went to big box retail stores, locally owned stores, trying to determine whether any suspicious purchases were made. They went through receipts and sales records, and some of those receipts provided investigators with critical evidence. That then reportedly led to a federal search warrant, which was used to obtain the suspect's IP address, which showed that he'd been making suspicious Google searches. And then the big break in the investigation came when the suspect went to a FedEx store in South Austin to drop off two suspicious packages on Sunday. And so there's surveillance footage and photos of the bomber looking like he's wearing a blonde wig and gloves. And then finally, according to these reports, police use cell phone triangulation technology to track the suspect to a hotel parking lot. Now, as far as who the suspected bomber is, many media outlets are identifying him. We, of course, on this show, we don't name, we don't show him. That said, we can still talk about the facts of the situation without adding to a person's name or face being infamous. Uh, Police sources identified him as a 24-year-old white male, although public records show that he is a 23-year-old. Very little right now is known about the suspect. He reportedly lived in Pflugerville, which is a city northeast of Austin. He attended an Austin community college. He previously worked as a computer repair technician. He also worked at a semi conductor company as a purchasing agent. There are also descriptions that have come from like the grandmother, neighbors, and it's usually what you see in this situation. People are shocked, but not really much else at this time that paints a clearer picture. We also saw the Austin Police Department tweet, investigators have detained two roommates of the Austin bombing suspect. One roommate was detained, questioned, and released. The other is currently being questioned. Their names will not be released because they are not under arrest at this time. But that's where we are right now. We'll see if more information comes out soon. And, and where I want to end this story is to, to once again thank law enforcement for, for their ability to track this scumbag down. And also a reminder to those in Texas to to be mindful of any suspicious packages and report them to police. Hopefully there were no other packages sent out, but it's better to be safe here. And then very quickly, let's talk about Art Jones, who you may remember from our past coverage. To oversimplify his storied history, uh, he was associated with the American Nazi Party for a while, he is a Holocaust denier, and he is now also running as a Republican in Illinois. Specifically, Illinois' third congressional district race. And of course, this made news because you usually do not have someone so openly 
horrible running for uh, for office. And a lot of people started tying this guy into what Republicans are becoming, but of course, it's very important to point out that both on a national level and local level, GOP have, have denounced this guy. And if you actually look into the story, they, they've tried to stop him in the past from running, they weren't able to stop him this time, and it's in a district that is very, very Democrat. Now, all of that said, we recently had the primaries, and as far as the Democrats, Dan Lipinski beat out his challenger, Mary Newman, 45,000 votes to 44,000. And in the Republican primary, Jones still received 20,000 plus votes. And that to me is personally concerning because Art Jones made local news, Art Jones made national news, and yet either people still knew about this and were like, ah, whatever, or you had that many people who were ignorant to who he was, but they were still voting for him. That is incredibly troubling just from a society standpoint of either hate and or ignorance. Uh, obviously, it's not troubling in the sense of he has a chance to win. Just wow, that, that's, that's eye-opening for several reasons. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today, and today in awesome brought to you by Ting. Ting, of course, a fantastic pay what you actually use, no BS contracts, overage charges, unlimited plan cell service. You just pay for the service you use. It is incredibly simple. It saves a lot of people a lot of money. In fact, Ting customers on average pay just $23 a month for their one device. And so if you wanna check it out, see how much money you could be saving, go to phil.ting.com. And if you sign up that way, it'll give you $25 towards your first device or $25 in Ting credit. And the first bit of awesome we got, well, depending on who you are, this is either awesome or you're gonna hate it. The trailer just dropped for Johnny Knoxville's newest movie, Action Point. And I think just in general, I'm excited to see Johnny Knoxville back. Then we got a trailer for Under the Silver Lake. We also got a trailer for The Titan. We had Charlie Quartz giving us a kindergarten weather report. Very big story, gave us a video on the voice behind 250 of your favorite cartoons. And if you wanna see the full versions of everything, I just shared the secret link of the day, anything at all. Links as always are in the description down below. Then we should talk about the school shooting in Maryland. This happened yesterday morning in Great Mills High School in Great Mills, Maryland. There's reportedly one shooter, two victims. The shooter reportedly a 17 year old male brought a handgun to the school. He shot a 16 year old female student by the name of Jalen Wiley in a hallway. Luckily there was a school resource officer nearby, Blaine Gaskell, he responded and engaged the shooter. Reportedly he fired his weapon while the shooter also fired his. That said, as of right now, it's not clear whether the SRO's bullet or the shooter's bullet resulted in the shooter's death, but he was also pronounced dead. As far as the other victim, there was also a 14 year old male who was wounded in the leg during the shooting, although it is not clear how he was wounded right now, but he currently is in stable condition and the 16 year old female victim is currently in the ICU with life threatening injuries. Now as far as the potential motive, authorities during a press conference said that the shooter had a previous relationship with the female victim. There is an indication that a prior relationship existed between the shooter and the female victim. We are working as we speak to determine if that was and if so the extent of that and if it was part of the motive for this shooting. But they also later said that it's not clear if that was the motive. Also, as far as how the shooter got the gun, as of right now, that's not clear. The ATF has reportedly initiated an emergency trace on that weapon. And of course, following this situation, this really added fuel to the gun debate. Many who are pro-gun saying this is a perfect example of how you stop bad guys with a gun with a good guy with a gun. You also have people like Dana Lash on NRA TV saying that this kind of news doesn't get reported by the mainstream. Saying the mainstream media is not talking about the SRO because it disrupts their narrative. No, you're not hearing anyone in the media talk about it because it disrupts their narrative. Questioning what the media has against individuals protecting themselves with weapons. I question what, what the media has against individuals defending their lives. But also, and, and I'm not one to, to always go out of my way to defend mainstream media, it just wasn't true. CNN, who she specifically mentioned, they covered this angle. You also had the Washington Post noting the SRO, the New York Times noting the SRO. The NRA posted her clips between 9.40 a.m., 10.40 a.m. The first press conference didn't happen until 8.30 a.m. when there wasn't a lot of information confirmed and then the second press conference with more information took place at 10.30 a.m. And so to me personally, it feels like she's the one that's pushing the false narrative here. And as far as the gun debate goes, I think a lot of rational people can go, one, I am very glad that that school resource officer was there and engaged a shooter. And also two, we need to talk about guns because we need to ask how did a 17 year old get a handgun? Was it an illegal sale? Did he take it from a family member? Did he steal it? Also, why are we seeing some of the same people that, that criticize the, the people that they are against for politicizing a school shooting? The bodies, the bodies aren't even cold yet. But you have Lash and the NRA doing just that while there is a girl in the hospital in critical condition. I'm just saying it appears that there's a lot of hypocrisy out there when it comes to situations like this. And then let's talk about pieces of some Donald Trump news that we have. And we'll start off with ladies first. Stormy, of course, said that she had a sexual relationship and affair with Donald Trump when he was married with Melania. There was an initial denial that it came out that there was an NDA and there was a payment and then there was a potential breach of the NDA. And since then, the new information we have here is that Stormy Daniels' lawyer said that she was physically threatened to stay silent. Was she threatened in any way? Yes. Mm. Was she threatened physical harm? 
Yes. We all saw a response from the other side. On Friday, Trump's lawyers filed a $20 million lawsuit against Daniels for allegedly breaking an NDA. And this is a big deal, obviously, because you have Trump's lawyers, so essentially Donald Trump, but definitely not Donald Trump, because, you know, lawyers just pay porn stars $130,000 and get them to sign NDAs, even though, uh, nothing happened. Also with Stormy, the results from a 2011 polygraph test that she took along with the interview she did back then, that was made public, and, and she was asked if she had unprotected vaginal sex with Donald Trump, so she said yes, she passed. That said, she was also asked, did Trump say you would get on The Apprentice? He answered yes. The results were inconclusive. But then also, it is important to understand that a polygraph is, is not exact. It's not admissible in most jurisdictions, and if you look into the science of it all, it shouldn't be admissible. So there was that. We also had Karen McDougal's story, which is interesting for a different reason. She's a former Playboy model who allegedly had an affair with Donald Trump. And back in November of 2016, American Media Inc., the parent company of the National Enquirer, bought the rights to McDougal's story for $150,000 and never ran it. And so this was a prime example of what people call catch and kill where you have these organizations that buy the rights to a story and then bury it so it doesn't get out there to protect someone. But she popped up in the news because yesterday she filed a lawsuit against AMI saying that she was misled into signing the agreement. Lawsuit saying she was tricked into signing it while being misled as to its contents, including by her own lawyer on whose advice she was entitled to rely. And in response, AMI released a statement saying Karen McDougal has been free to respond to press inquiries about her relationship with President Trump since 2016. Thus, the suggestion that AMI quote, silenced her is completely without merit. Rather, Karen signed a contract that gave AMI the editorial discretion to publish her life story, and she promised to write health and fitness columns and appear on the cover of two magazines. They then go into detail about what McDougal has done with them, and then they add, her lawsuit is the first time AMI has learned of her desire to go a different direction. AMI has a valid contract with Ms. McDougal, and we look forward to reaching an amicable resolution satisfactory to her and to AMI. And the last of the ladies in the news today is Summer Zervos, who actually has a lawsuit seeking less than $3,000 in damages, but the ramifications could be huge. Summer is a former contestant on The Apprentice. And in October of 2016, Zervos claimed that Trump sexually assaulted her twice in 2007. Once at a lunch meeting in New York City where she says he kissed her twice on the lips, another time in Beverly Hills where she says he aggressively kissed her and touched her breasts. Now the statute of limitations for those alleged actions has passed, but we're talking about a different situation. In January of 2017, Zervos decides to sue Donald Trump for defamation. This because Trump has dismissed Zervos' and other women's accusations saying that they're total fiction, it's all false stuff, also suggesting that she made it up for 10 minutes of fame. And on this case, one of the big things being argued by Trump's lawyer, Mark Kazowitz, was that Trump's comments amounted to political speech during the election, and so he could not be sued in state court under the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution. However, on Tuesday, the judge sided with Summers' lawyer. Judge Jennifer Schechter deciding that the Supreme Court decision that allowed a sexual harassment suit against Bill Clinton made clear that presidents could be sued for unofficial conduct. Also saying that nothing in the Supremacy Clause states that a president cannot be called to state court for his actions, not in the capacity as president. Also dismissing that the lawsuit should be postponed because of his duties noting that the state court couldn't compel Trump to take any official action, also saying that delaying the case until Trump leaves office couldn't be justified on the ground that the president might have to deal with an international crisis, saying if and when he does, of course, important federal responsibilities will take precedent. And the reason this could potentially be a massive deal is that if all of this stands, the president would likely have to go to a deposition, during which he would most likely be asked about the other alleged affairs and scandals, or we end up seeing the case getting settled for money. And so when we're talking about a situation where the president of the United States may be deposed, that's massive news. Because I think like a lot of other people, when it comes to the stories where he had affairs, he had consensual sex. I don't care. The actual act of a consensual affair, although the conversation around Clinton Lewinsky has changed recently because of the Me Too movement, people talking about power differentials. The actual cheating of these other men, I don't care about. What, what's interesting about these stories are the legal problems. The situation that started with some far-fetched story from Stormy Daniels now has massive legal implications. But that said, we'll have to wait and see what happens, and obviously, we'll all be watching. That said, separately from the ladies, Donald Trump came under fire for an interaction with Vladimir Putin. On Tuesday, during a scheduled call with Putin, Trump reportedly congratulated congratulated him on his win. This despite, reportedly, the Washington Post was told by officials in on the call that in the president's briefing materials, it said, do not congratulate in all caps. Along with that, Trump also reportedly ignored all talking points that pointed him to condemning the recent poisoning of a Russian spy in the UK, all during a call that Trump characterized as a, quote, very good call. Others, though, did not agree. Among them, you had Senator John McCain. He released a statement saying, an American president does not lead the free world by congratulating dictators on winning sham elections. And by doing so with Vladimir Putin, President Trump insulted every Russian citizen who has denied the right to vote in a free and fair election to determine their country's future, including the countless Russian patriots who have risked so much to protest and resist Putin's regime. We also saw people like Senator Marco Rubio who tweeted, I don't agree with congratulating Putin, but bigger outrage is this leak that could only come from someone in POTUS's inner circle. If you don't like the president, resign, but this ongoing pattern of duplicity holds potential for serious damage to the nation. And on that note, if everything in the story is accurate and the, the leak is essentially his briefing papers from before the call and then information about what happened on the 
call. I mean, not only is that a notable leak, but it also seems like a leak intended to embarrass the president. And actually, we also got a last second update to this story. President Trump tweeted, I called President Putin of Russia to congratulate him on his election victory in past. Obama called him also. The fake news media is crazy because they wanted me to excoriate him. They are wrong. Getting along with Russia and others is a good thing, not a bad thing. They can help solve problems with North Korea, Syria, Ukraine, ISIS, Iran, and even the coming arms race. Bush tried to get along, but didn't have the smarts. Obama and Clinton tried, but didn't have the energy or chemistry. Remember, reset. He's through strength. And I will say two notes there. Uh, fact checking this. One, he is actually right. Obama did congratulate Putin back in 2012. But you also have people pointing out that while that may be true, it was a different situation. Back in 2012, Russia hadn't yet annexed Crimea, intervened in Ukraine, committed alleged atrocities in Syria, allegedly meddled in the 2016 election. So that's why you have some saying that this is apples to apples, while others are saying, no, this is apples to oranges. And for now, where I want to leave this story is with a question to you, and that is, what, what do you think is the bigger deal here? The president's actions or the leak? And also, with the comparison of Obama to Trump and the congratulations, do you think that, personally, that that is apples to apples or apples to oranges? I'd love to know what you think in those comments down below. And that's where I'm going to end today's show. And remember, if you liked this video, you like what I'm trying to do on this channel, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications. Also, if you missed yesterday's Philip DeFranco show, you want to catch up, click or tap right there to watch that. Or if you want to see some of the new behind the scenes that we posted today, click or tap right there to watch that. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.